Welcome back to another episode of Rock Boys Football Texas. Texas A&M roster battle going down until, like, as college football fans, we've had this one circled for quite a long time. Really fired up to get into this one. I know the whole college football landscape. If you are a college football fan, you're fired up for this matchup roster battle. Going to go position group by position group, stack these two teams. You know, it's not necessarily a prediction of the outcome of the game, more just getting a feel for the talent level on both of these rosters. Fired up to get into it before we get into it. And as always, one, just want to say thank you to you guys. It, I mean, it's been a blast talking both of these programs. It is no secret that the boys are quite high on both of these teams heading into 2024. If y'all do enjoy the content, consider subscribing to the channel. But much more importantly, let it fly in the comment section. That is the beauty of college football. That is the beauty of this kind of rivalry. Whether you agree with the boys, whether you disagree with the boys, whether you're going at it with the opposing fan base, have that in the comment section. We always love talking ball with you guys down there. And Dill, without further ado, let's get into this one. And I want to start with the most important position on the football field, the quarterback spot, Connor Wigman, Quinn Ewers. I'll give you the first word here. I'm going Ewers, and just watching the progression he's made over the past couple of years, I mean, he's really turning into a big-time college quarterback, yep. getting more athletic. I think that was a big part of his game, just being able to create a little bit more than he probably did in 22. But just he's got that arm talent. You've always known he's had it. He's starting to put it together. If he takes another jump, I mean, he's going to be a big-time, big-time uh, So the Texas A&M fans know Connor Wigman is like my dark horse heading into 2024. I don't think – a lot of the college football fans who follow the recruiting trail are quite familiar with Connor Wigman. I don't think a lot of the casual college football fans are. I think Connor Wigman is going to be a household name come the end of November, but sitting here – in late May, you have to go with Quinn Ewers and Dill. Like you said, you saw a massive step in the right direction from Quinn Ewers in 2023. And I think a lot of Texas fans are fired up for I mean, what does it look like if Quinn Ewers takes another step heading into 2024? I think you got two really, really talented quarterbacks. I think the quarterback play is going to be quite good in this matchup. Go to the next position, Dill. Let's talk the wide receiver room where I know you're awfully high on this Texas wide receiver room, so I'll give you the first word here. Aggies, Longhorns, who you got in that pass catcher room? You kind of said it. I mean, Texas, there is that part of them that they're turning it over a little bit. Yeah. Obviously, All their production's pretty much gone at both the tight end wide receiver spot, but I mean, they just brought the talent in. I think they needed to do. I think Isaiah Bond is really, really good, very underrated. And then I kind of look at what they have as young guys, too. I think, again, their combination of having some old vets who've played a fair amount of football for other teams who have played at a pretty high level, along with guys like John T. Cook, Ryan Wingo, DeAndre Moore. I just think this is going to be a really, really good unit, especially seeing the way John T. Cook played in the spring game because, I mean, he's a guy I think is going to be a big time. Yeah, player. I don't think enough people are talking about John T. Cook. That's another one as the recruiting nerds that we are. We've liked John T. Cook since he's come out of high school, but this is a guy that – I mean, everyone's talking about Isaiah Bond and guys like Matthew Golden. Jonte Cook's going to produce for this Texas team. I'm going to go Texas too, but I do want to give a little disclaimer. I think this Texas A&M wide receiver is damn good. I think Moose Muhammad has been, you know, just kind of flying under the radar as a really solid player for Texas A&M. I'm going to get a little bit more opportunity heading into 2024. I think John A. Walker, you talk about someone who showed out in the spring game, Noah Thomas. Like this is a good wide receiver room. But Noah Thomas, like being able to run after the catch, doing some of those other things. We've always known you can get downfield, make plays, make contested catches, but he has started to show, show, show some different things and how they might use him in this AM scheme with Colin Klein. I think it's going to be really interesting to see. Again, I think a lot of guys on AM have been held back by really poor offensive coaching. Yep. For a handful of years. So it's going to be interesting to see what guys like Moose yeah. Muhammad and Noah Thomas can do under a guy who really knows how to call him and, off. And lack of quarterback play. I mean, you look at uh, Texas A&M for the last couple of years, the like quarterback injuries not going with the right guys. Uh, I think this wide receiver room is damn good, but it's really hard to go against Texas, who has, in my mind, a top five wide receiver room in the country. Going to the running back room, you have two running backs, and you don't see Ruben Owens on this roster. He's listed as the third running back. I think he leads that Aggies team in rushing yards. C.J. Baxter, Ruben Owens were the top two running backs in that 2023 class. I'll give you the first word here. You taking Texas or Texas A&M in that running back room? 
I'm taking the Aggies. And I know the Texas fans are going to give it to me. And in my reasoning is probably, I think Ruben Owens, CJ Baxter are close. I think those are two of the more bright, promising young running backs in all of college football. I just think I trust Le'Veon Moss and Amari Daniels, those backups a little bit more. I think they've played at a bit of a higher level. I know Jaden Blue's good. I know the Texas fans have been telling us that yeah. he's going to wake us up next fall. Again, I just maybe have a little more faith in, especially Le'Veon Moss. I think he's a really, really good running back. Compliments can run physical. I'll lean Texas a and but it's tight because they both got two horses up at the Yeah, top. I don't feel good about this one either, but I'm going to I'm gonna follow suit. I'm going to follow suit for a little bit of a different reason. And I think I'm following suit because I cannot wait to see Ruben Owens in this Coach Klein offense. I mean, you look at how Coach Klein constructed that rushing attack at Kansas State, getting his running backs out to the perimeter, letting them operate in space. I, I mean, I can't think of a better running back to run that kind of way than a guy like Ruben Owens. If you can manufacture the football to him in space, get some of those one-on-one matchups, he's going to be a running back that I think thrives in this Colin Klein offense. So I'm going to go Texas A&M as well. Going to the offensive line, I think this is a no-brainer, right? I, I really do trust Adam Cushion to get this Texas A&M offensive line to take a step, but sitting here early May, like it is extremely difficult not to go with the Texas Longhorns. You return, I mean, Kelvin Banks Jr., top 15 NFL draft pick. You look at DJ Campbell, probably going to be a top 100 draft pick. And then you look at this Texas offensive line and say, they've played so much football together over the last couple of years, and that is like a massive storyline that nobody really talks about in the era of college football where you know, so many teams are turning over so many units year to year with the transfer portal. You look at this Texas offensive line, the continuity, the chemistry that's been developed. I think this Texas offensive line is one of the best in the country. I'm certainly going with the Longhorns here. Yeah, I think there's no nothing to add. I mean, everyone kind of knows AM's offense. It's The question is that offensive line, they obviously have the talent around it. Can they play good there? Texas, you just know they've been good for a couple of years now, really developed the position well. They're going to they're be one of the better years. All right, so going to the defensive line, I got my pick here. And I, I don't think that – okay, I'll, I'll preface with them going with a and i I'm going to start talking about Texas first. And I'm looking at Texas and saying there are a lot of people that look at Byron Murphy, Tavondre Sweat, leaving this program and saying this defensive line is going to take a step back. One, they did a very nice job. Some names that you don't see on these depth charts because they haven't been updated that have come in to this Texas Longhorns program. Yeah, it's fair to say the inside of the defensive line might take a small step back because you lose two NFL caliber guys. The edge rusher position is going to be absolutely loaded for this Texas team. I think they get significantly better. You bring in a guy like Trey Moore, Justice Finkley, it seems like he might be starting to put it together. Baron Sorrell has been just a steady commodity for Texas. And then you talk about true freshman Colin Simmons, who, again, you don't see on the screen here. He's going to be a guy that contributes early. But you look at this Texas A&M defensive line, and I think you legit have, I mean, three guys that could be first-round picks in 12 months, right? Nick Skirton. You look at Shamar Turner, Shamar Stewart, and say, I think this Texas A&M defensive line is one of the best units in the country. I'm going with the Aggies here. Yeah, I mean, you just kind of project what Nick Skirton can be and in, in, in what he looked like at Purdue. <laughs> Obviously, Shamar Turner and Shamar, Shamar Stewart both have really played good football for a while for A&M. I, you're kind of right. I, and I think Texas people do sleep a little bit. I don't think Alfred Collins gets the respect he deserves. Yeah, I agree. He's a hammer. I don't think they necessarily needed to bring in any uh, like highly, highly paid guy, if you want to call it that, or one of those guys that you really would have to sell out for, because I do think Alfred Collins can hold it down. They just needed a little bit of depth. I think some of their young guys, Alex January, comes to my mind as a guy who I really think can emerge. But at the end of the day, you just look – a and M's kind of ready, ready-made defensive line. They were really good. They kept a fair amount of the talent from last year, even with the coaching change. It, and I'm going to be a really good. I, that's another thing. Like I feel like people just look at Walter Nolan transferring out and saying, "Oh, Texas A and M, big hit on the defensive line." And Walter Nolan, I don't even know was was he a top five defensive lineman for Texas A and M last year? I would maybe answer maybe four or five, but he certainly wasn't that dominant force that some people expect him to be. Now I'm confident he puts together going together going into year three with Ole Miss, but I don't think that was as big of a loss as I think some of the college football media made it. They'll go into the linebacker room. 
This one is awfully tricky. I think they Texas A&M made a massive move getting Solomon to Shields. We are both very big fans of him coming from Pitt, a guy you don't see on this roster. I think what it comes down to, and I'll give you the first word here, Torrey and York, Anthony Hill Jr., two of the best young linebackers that you see in the country. I'll give you the floor here. Linebacker room, Longhorns, Aggies, who are you going with? I think I'd go the Longhorns, and I love Torrey and York. He's one of my favorite young linebackers in all the country. Anthony Hill Jr. is a kind of a different animal. I mean, just the way he can impact games in a variety of different ways, can play that true linebacker spot, can get after the quarterback, makes a lot of plays. I think David Benda is a very underrated player, really solid guy, I think, to run with. I think Leona Lafu, I think that there's a lot of potential there for him to play really well. So, again, just because I kind of trust those number twos, two or three, if you will, for a, for Texas a little more than AM, because I like Solomon the Shields, but I think there's still like – you want to see him kind of play at a really high level. I thought he looked good at Pitt. I don't know that I'd say it was dominant football at Pitt. But again, I think it was a huge ad. I didn't want to see Scooby Williams necessarily be forced to play that off-ball role. So I think it was big, a big move. I just like Texas a little bit. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go Texas too, and I don't feel good about it. You know, because I, I really do like Torrey and York. But I think you hit the nail on the head. I think Anthony Hill is just... Uh, He's the, the physical trace that this kid has. Uh, Tory New York's awesome. He is one of the highest IQ linebackers that you'll see in the country as a true freshman. I am going to bet on Anthony Hill Jr. I mean, emerging as one of the more dominant forces that you see in all of college football. I'm going to go Texas here, and then Bill going to the secondary. I'm gonna. I think this is going to be a hot take. I'm going to go with Texas A&M, and I think there's a couple of reasons why I'm going with Texas A&M. One, they have completely revamp this secondary you look at all the names that they brought in and then you combine that with what mike elko has been able to do coaching up defensive backs I, there's just too many names that were really really good at previous stops in 2023 that it's coming into this texas a&m roster i think this is going to be one of the most improved units in the country i love the addition of a guy like will lee or donovan sanders I mean, those guys are NFL caliber dudes in terms of physical traits. If they can kind of take that step in the development, I I think the secondary is going to be really good. Now, I have a feeling where you're going to go, so I'll give you the chance to kind of make your argument here. In this Longhorn secondary has me in a perpetual battle of the fact that I kind of look, they have two guys in Derek Williams and Malik Muhammad, especially Malik Muhammad, who I think is going to no doubt first round pick when he goes out into the league, just the talent level he has, the yeah. athleticism. I mean, he's really, really, I think he's going to have a huge year. I think Derek Williams really started to play good. Gavin Holmes, I have a lot of confidence in going back to the Wake Forest here. I think he had a solid year last year. And adding Makuba, I mean, really what you're kind of looking for is somehow this defensive coaching staff figuring it out. And I think it's a big year for them, frankly, because I think if they play poorly again, I think you're going to see some changes. I think this team's too good, too talented to play the way they did last year. I think Texas is going to figure it out. I just think the talent's too, there's too much talent. There. Just in the secondary, I might add, because I'm not really questioning uh, like the defensive coaching staff as a whole for Texas. That was an elite defense. No, 100%, but you can't have that Washington game where you can't stop it. Like, they just go up and down on you. And I know Penix was playing really well, but when you're Texas and you're trying to win national titles, that you can't have it. You can't I'm going to rephrase what you're going, what I think you're trying to say. And I think you're trying to say that this Texas secondary is way better than what they played in some of their games. Like you look at you look at that Texas secondary and say there are multiple guys that are NFL caliber dudes in that secondary. And I, I think at times the coaching staff didn't treat them like that. Like, hey, let them play some press man covers. Let them go get some hands on wide receivers. They are good enough to make that kind of thing happen. You want to see that step. Now, I think it's worth noting that you played a lot of youngsters in that Texas secondary last year, right? Whether it was Terrence Brooks, Malik Muhammad, Derek Williams, all of those guys were first, second year players. I think the addition of Andrew McCuba is huge. And also, we sleep on Johnny Barrett. You talk yeah. about one of the best nickelbacks in the country. Like, he is an absolute stud. We never seem to talk about him. He's all the way on the bottom of that roster right there. The talent's there. I And you had Andrew McCuba. You might have just talked to him with going to Texas. But I'm going to stay firm. And my well, it is tough because I look at AM and that's a really, really talented secondary. Now, loaded. Another secondary that didn't play good last year. Obviously, they've really shuffled the deck, if you will, and it's it's just a totally new unit. So last year is almost irrelevant. I like that they really keep some of their young guys like Javen Thomas and, and Dalton Brooks. I think those two are very promising. But I just think adding all that 
all those guys like Willie Ratcliffe, those guys who played really good football at, at a high level in college. I think that was huge for them. It's and they so were deep. Like we're not even talking about guys like Des Ricks who are going to be like in your three D for this day. The competition, the depth is incredible for Texas A and M. All right, Bill, we'll we'll table it at that. We're going to talk about these two teams a lot over the next couple months. Obviously, going to break down this game from a multitude of different angles. Appreciate you guys rocking with the boys. Let it fly in the comment section. And if y'all do enjoy the content, consider subscribing to the channel. We'll talk to y'all later. Peace.